والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله you are watching the way of the muslim defining the muslim character i'm your host yusuf estes and for the next few minutes i'd like to talk to us on the subject of building up and defining the Muslim character by following the ways and the teachings of the hadith or sayings of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. The first of the hadiths, teachings of Muhammad that I'd like to refer to is this one which deals with the subject of the mirror. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, the believer is a mirror for the believer and the believer is the brother of the believer he safeguards his property for him and defends him from the back the word mirat in arabic seems to be the word that we derive our word in english mirror from and i was speaking to one of our brothers earlier about the subject of what type of mirror did Prophet Muhammad Wasallam have? He said it was very common for the Arabs in those days to use the water. So if you had a pail of water, bucket of water, or a pool of water, you could look into that and it could be your mirror. And I was thinking, well, that's pretty good. If you don't like what you see, just stick your finger in and stir it up. <laughs> you don't have to break it. But... To be serious about this, when we consider what is it to be a mirror for our brother, because when someone is close to you and you know them and you see that they have a mistake, it's important in Islam to inform them in a gentle and positive way because you're actually seeing something in them that maybe even you have yourself. So that's my first thing is to see if I have that. And then when I go to correct them about it, I want to do it very gentle so that we are mirrors for each other to help each other grow and to be better people. And that defines Muslim character very well. And as regards the next part of it, when it says that the believer is a brother to a believer, well, obviously, it's not talking about the biological brother. But it means this, that you would have such a strong tie to your relations that now as believers you have an even stronger tie to each other. And Allah mentions this to us in Surah Al-Imran. If you look in Surah Al-Imran, you find that Allah talks about that He found us on the brink of a pit of fire and then He joined our hearts together by giving us this big nam or favor, the deen of Islam. And He brought us together as brothers and then He ordered us not to separate from each other. And so in the same way, we see that this is telling us about our brotherhood. And how do you feel about your relatives? You love them. You want to see good for them. And you want to be with them. And so it should be the same way with your brothers in faith. And now, let's come to another subject here about dua, or the supplications. And this one is on... Uh, the Prophet is saying to us that dua or supplication is worship. Your Lord, the mighty and the majestic, has said, so this means Allah has said this, call upon me and I will respond to your invocation. Whenever you have anything that you need, any subject that you feel that you need help with, the first and foremost to turn to is going to be Allah. If I want anything, why would I ask from the people when I can ask from Allah? And Allah is saying that if you call upon me, I'm going to answer you. Now we have another saying of Muhammad Sallallahu He says, seek and you'll find. Ask and it's going to be given to you. And knock and it will be open for you. And we find this same teaching in Christianity. What is it that I'm supposed to seek after? And what am I supposed to ask for? Well, as a Muslim, 
Every day we ask Allah. Adina Saratul Mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. And, okay, but what am I seeking after? What is it that, that I'm looking for? Guidance. I need to be guided by Allah. And where will I find this guidance? And then it says, knock. And what am I knocking on? And what's going to be opened? I don't get it. Well, look at the Quran, the very first surah or chapter is called what? The opening. And certainly that makes sense. Because if I'm asking Allah for guidance, if I'm seeking from Him the surat al-mustaqim, guide us to the straight path, then it makes sense that I would open the Quran and the first surah is called opening. And it opens up the subject. And what is the subject for us? The subject is how to be a Muslim, the way of the Muslim, and have this right character. And that's exactly what our program is about. So that makes a lot of sense. Ask Allah, and He'll respond to your invocation. One of the things, too, Allah teaches us in the Quran about asking Him. Suppose I'd like to learn the Quran. I want to know Quran. I want to know the Arabiya. But how will I learn this? How will I get this together? Well, you can go to books. You can go to tapes. You can go to the internet. You can go to the telephone. You can write letters. But the first and foremost you should have done, which according to this hadith we just learned, you should have asked the law. Begin by asking a law. I want to increase my knowledge. How can I increase this knowledge? And Allah tells us in the Quran how we can get that. There's a dua mentioned in Quran that if you say it, this is the best thing for you. Rabbi zidni ilma. Rabbi zidni ilma. Rabbi zidni ilma. O oh Allah, increase my knowledge. O oh Allah, increase my knowledge. O oh Allah, increase my knowledge. And so you supplicate to Allah you ask from him, he says, call upon me and I will answer your dua, your invocation. And by the way, I use that one a lot myself every day. Here's another one. And this is, a, again, short but very sweet and to the point. And it says here that the Prophet Sassam said, from the perfection of a person's Islam, is that he leaves alone the things that don't concern him. Now, if there is a better teaching, I'd like to know what it is. This is definitely an important one for me and for all of us. The perfection of your Islam is that you leave alone the things that don't concern you. There are many things, so many things that don't concern us that we seem to be involved in. We're worried so much about this item or that item. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about that the other day. Somebody was asking me about television. They said, is television haram? Well, I've asked the scholars about that. Is television haram? They said a lot of the programming is not permissible for the Muslims to watch. And then I said, well, what about things like the news and such as that? And they were telling me that, you know what? Why do you watch this news? There's a lot of things in the news that really don't concern you? Why are you so worried about the things that are happening in another country or in another place when you don't take care of the things that are right in front of you? I said, well, that does make sense. And why are you worried about this person over there or that person over here and you don't even know them, but you're not concerned about your own neighbor? And again, that makes good sense. You know, the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, told us to worry about our neighbors. Not somebody far remote and far away. No, he said, the ones close to you, your neighbors, they have rights on you. So we should be very careful about this subject. Don't be concerned about what? Things that don't concern you. In other words, butt out. <laughs> don't get into things. Good advice, beautiful advice. Another one that deals with the subject of our iman or our faith. Whoever loves for Allah and hates for Allah, gives for Allah 
and withholds for a law has completed his faith or his iman. Now, what do you think this means? When it's talking about loving for a law, we can understand that, but hating for a law? Why should I hate anything? We know that Allah is loving. He's al wadud. God is love, as as we know, is the ultimate of all love and loving. But still, what about this hate? How can I hate for Allah? I love many things for Allah. I love being a Muslim. I love good. I love to see charity being given, and I love to see people who are helping each other. Many wonderful things, and we love for the sake of Allah. We love each other for the sake of Allah. But what about this idea of hating for the sake of Allah? That's a little bit strange when we start talking about hate. But then when you think about it, isn't it correct though? Wouldn't we hate things that are against the things that we love? We love the truth, therefore we should hate lies. We love honesty, therefore we should hate whatever is dishonest. We love peace, Therefore, we should hate violence. And we love what's good for all people. And we certainly would hate terrorism. And this is a part of developing the Muslim character. To know the right things to love and the right things to hate. All for the sake of Allah. Now, when we talk about our iman, our faith, and developing this in Islam... There's another point I'd like to mention, and this comes from another hadith of Muhammad wasallam. He said, the example of a believer with regards to their iman is like the example of a horse with regards to the stake that it's tied to. It roams around, but then it comes back to the stake that it's normally tied to. And the believer is negligent, but then he turns to his faith, his iman. So feed the pious with your food and treat the believers well. This example shows us that just as you have a horse that's tied up to a stake, no matter how he wanders around, he's going to come back to that. Also, that we in our faith will wander around with things. We'll forget, but then we're going to come back because that's the nature really, of being a believer, that you come back to your iman or your faith. Then here's a good little tip that he mentions too. Feed the pious people and treat the believers in a good way. Treat them well. There's something that, I, I don't know if you do this in your community there, but this is a real good thing to do. That's fasting. The Prophet, peace be upon him, used to fast, voluntary fast. Now, if you have people doing that in your neighborhood or you're aware of where they're at, then you feed them. You get a big reward for that. But whether or they're fasting or not, this is all something really good is to feed the believers and treat them good. And that goes back to another one we were talking about before about being brothers to each other. Let's take a break and come back with more about the way of the Muslim defining the Muslim character. Hey everyone, check this out. If you are confused or surprised or a little astonished or maybe you have questions about life or the hereafter or maybe you need some help what about someone you can really trust someone reliable feel free to ask Huda Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we're back. You're watching Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. We've been talking about faith and iman in some of the earlier hadiths that we mentioned. Now we'd like to come to one that I find very interesting. And it's talking about joking and jesting. And in this particular hadith, 
narrated on the authority of Abu Huraira, the Prophet ﷺ was asked by his companions, do you joke with us? Because he liked sometimes to say a joke or something like that. And they were wondering, do you jest with us? Joke around with us? He said, yes, only I don't say things that aren't true. And there's a real good lesson for us today. You know, when we watch television, a lot of times we see programs that have these so-called funny parts in it, jokes and things like this. And we pick that up and we go out and start doing those same things ourselves. But a lot of times the things that we're saying in jokes are not true, they're lies. People would say, well, yeah, but it's a joke. But it's still a lie. And if it's a lie, it's not really good, is it? I realize sometimes we tell jokes that are fiction all the way. Why did so-and-so say such-and-such to this one, and how did that, and ha-ha-ha. But be careful that you don't tell things that specifically have lies in them, because this is something the Prophet didn't do, and it's certainly not a way to build a good Muslim character. And that's a piece of good advice for me, considering that I do deal with a lot of humor. I try to bring these programs to you in a way that will enjoy them and share together in a way that it's humorous, fun, and entertaining. But I don't want to make this mistake of lying. So I hope you'll make du'a for me. We mentioned in the, another segment when we talked about making du'a to Allah, so we'll make du'a for each other that Allah will keep us away from that. Now I want to come to a subject called nifaq. This is a subject in English called hypocrisy. And a hypocrite is something that is really serious. This is a problem to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, is going to throw these people in the deepest part of hell. And this is not a joke. This is something very, very serious when we come to the topic of nifaq or hypocrisy. Let's hear what the Prophet ﷺ said about that. And again, on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, two characteristics are not found together in a hypocrite. Good manners and an understanding of the religion, understanding of the deen of Islam. Now, that's definitely a good sign if a person has good manners and he has good understanding of the religion. This is something here he's telling you, this is a person who is not having this hypocrisy. But let's continue on that same topic because there's a beautiful teaching here that comes from one of the companions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi peace be upon him. And it's from Hanzala. And Hanzala says that Abu Bakr met me and asked, how are you doing, O Hanzala? I replied, Hanzala is guilty of nifaq or hypocrisy. And he said, Subhanallah, glory to Allah, what are you saying? And I said, when we're with Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, and he reminds us of the fire in the paradise, it's as though we can see it right in front of our eyes. Then when we depart from the messenger, salam, and we attend to our wives, our children, and our business, all of this starts to slip from our minds. And Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, I swear by God, we also experienced the same thing. So I went with Abu Bakr until we met the Prophet wasallam, And I told him, you know, Hanzala is guilty of hypocrisy, O Messenger of Allah. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to me, And how is that? And I said, because we're, when we're with you, you remind us of the heaven and the hell. And it's so much so as if we could see it. But then when we're with our wives and our children, our businesses, we have a tendency to just forget it and it slips away. And then he said, peace be upon him, by him who holds my soul in his hand. He's talking here about Allah. He's swearing by Allah. If you remain continually with me as you are... Uh, in this state, and remembering a law, then the angels would shake hands with you upon your beds and upon your roads. But, O oh, Hanzala, there is a time for this and a time for that, and a time for such and a time for so, and a time for this and a time for that. 
Now we got several things out of this hadith, by the way. We're going to go back and examine it and look and see how we can develop this character building from this. One of the things, of course, we're talking about hypocrisy. Nobody wants to be a hypocrite. But the kind of hypocrisy that Hanzala is talking about here is not the kind where you say one thing when you really mean something else. Because that's the real hypocrite. The one who is pretending to be something that he really isn't. He doesn't want anything to do with it, but he's pretending like he's with you. But in secrecy, he's ap uh, the opposite all the way. Now, the feeling that Hanzala is having is normal. And that's the point of the story. It's saying that when you're thinking about Allah, you're thinking about His Messenger, especially when you go for the Friday Juma Salah, or you're sitting with the scholars and the teachers, hopefully when you're watching programs like this, it makes you think of Allah. It makes you feel like, mm, man, I can almost see the paradise. I can almost see the fire. I, I don't want anything to do with that. And then when we get away from it, though, we are out here with our friends, our family, our business, and we start thinking about everything else. And suddenly when we do reflect back, we say, oh, my God, what's the matter with me that I forgot that important message that I got from the imam or from my teacher today? What happened to me? How did I just kind of get away from all of that? And this is what we're talking about, this type of nifak that Hanzala was afraid of. And he goes to Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr assures him that we have the same problem. And now here's the prophet telling him, yes, even he's swearing by Allah that if you were to have this kind of level of iman, that you were thinking about Allah and you were thinking about the paradise and the hellfire all the time, it would be such that the angels would be shaking hands over your bed. I like that expression. And it, it would be as though they're meeting you on the road. So... This is not our life. We're not expecting ourselves or our children to be at such a level that all they think about is the Quran and all they're thinking about is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu That's extreme and that is, again, not really a balance that we're looking for to develop this good Muslim character. What we're looking for here is to get a balance, to have a time when you spend in Salah. And then you certainly you think of Allah in your Salah, in your worship. And there's a time for you to go out and work and be involved in your work. And there's a time for you to go out and do your sports and enjoy. There's a time to have fun, as we learned from the other hadith talking about joking. There is a time for these things. But then there's a time to be serious. And then when the prophet said, and he mentioned it three times, there's a time for this and a time for that, a time for this, a time for that, Time for this, a time for that. He said it three times. And this is mentioned in other hadiths that he used to say things three times. And it's mentioned also in previous revelations that there's a time for love and a time for hate, a time to plant and a time to sow. And there's a time for life and a time for death. To all things there's a time. And this is something real important for us to focus on today, to have the right time to do the right thing. It's important for us as Muslims to balance things in our lives so that when we go forward and we teach our children and other people around us observe, they say, you know what? That's the kind of character I wish I was. I wish I would have these qualities in me. And believe it or not, that's one of the best ways to call people to true Islam is to live as an example of a Muslim yourself. Because what better way to speak volumes in libraries of a particular subject than to act it yourself. Let people see the Islam in you. Let them see the good qualities, the real characters that we've been talking about right along. We talked about truthfulness. We talked about integrity. We talked about honesty. We've talked about a person having the kind of qualities that he's so worried, you know, even thinking about the fact that I'm getting away from thinking about a law bothers me. Now, this is the kind of character that is going to bring about the development in me and people around me that's going to be favorable with the law. And for sure, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi peace be upon him, said in another hadith, that whoever tries to please the people at the expense of displeasing the law, then Allah is displeased with them. And he's going to make the people displeased. But whoever tries to please Allah
even at the expense of displeasing the people, then Allah is pleased with him and he'll make the people be pleased with him eventually. And this is something that I think that all of us can take a big benefit from to realize that what I do is for the sake of Allah. I'm not doing anything to show off. I'm not doing anything to get any material reward here. I don't really care. If you like it, alhamdulillah. If you don't like it, well, that's your choice. But if I have this attitude and I'm doing things really for Allah, people notice that and they appreciate it. And this will really make a big difference. I want to now move to another topic on this, and that's talking about our sins. The Prophet ﷺ said, Beware of sins that are treated as minor, just like people who camp near the center of a valley. And then somebody brings one stick of firewood, and somebody else brings a stick of firewood. But eventually they're going to bring enough sticks of firewood that you can build enough of a fire to bake bread in. And keeping that in mind, then he continues, he said, Likewise, sins which are treated as being minor and for which the person is taken to account will destroy him. This is a pretty heavy statement. I want to think about that for a minute. My sins. Comparing my sins, minor sins. Yeah, it's something small. Have you ever had that, you know, when somebody's talking to you about, well, this is not really a big sin. It's just a little small thing. The white lies that we spoke about in one of our other programs. The little, you know, cheating on a test here and there. Or, you know, it doesn't matter. You can just sneak around and, and your folks won't ever know what you did. These are the kinds of sins that really will add up and add up and add up. Just as what? Just as exactly the same as those sticks coming one by one by one by one that build up this huge, big fire. It's interesting he used that expression because none of us want to go to the fire. Now you're watching the way of a Muslim, defining the Muslim character. We'd like to use these teachings to define our characters to be better Muslims. Until next time, this is Yusuf Estes reminding you that Islam is all about submission to Allah. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.